This is the Mondo Weiss Podcast. I'm Dave Reed. Mondo Weiss was founded by Phil Weiss, a career journalist, while he was on staff at the New York Observer. In 2006, a wealthy young man named Jared Kushner bought the Observer. After tolerating Phil's writing on Israel for a brief period, Phil was forced out by Kushner, but he was allowed to keep his blog. Phil is a magnanimous guy, and he credits Kushner with freeing him from the world of mainstream journalism to pursue his interest in Israel and the fascination with it that much of American Jewish society clings to. We get asked a lot about the name of the site, Mondo Weiss. It was the name of the blog version when it was hosted at The Observer, and Phil kept it when he left. One definition of the word Mondo is very or extremely. So the name Mondo Weiss was meant as a lighthearted joke that the site would be extremely Weiss because initially Phil was the only author. But the site has grown and evolved into a full-fledged news and analysis publication with staff in the United States and Palestine. We are one of the only U.S.-based publications with a full Palestine news bureau and not simply one reporter in the region. So Jared Kushner might have hoped to prevent Phil from gaining an audience for critical takes on Israel, Zionism, and the American Jewish community, but instead he helped launch an important media outlet in the struggle for Palestinian freedom. This episode of our podcast features an extended interview with Phil, conducted by Miko Peled, the veteran Israeli anti-occupation campaigner. They discuss the origins of Mondo Weiss, how Zionism destroyed American Jewish culture, and many other topics. It was originally published on Miko's podcast in January of this year in three parts. We're excited to share it with you here in one program. Okay, Phil Weiss, thank you for uh, letting me come and interview you. My pleasure, Miko. It's great great to get to know you better. Great to see you one-on-one like this. Same here. So, I want to start with something you said last time we met, okay. which was at the um, Alex Oda dinner in Southern California, mm-hmm. the fall of 2021. Okay. You received a, a very well-deserved award. Thank you. And you said something about the destruction of your culture, of the Jewish-American culture. Okay. And uh, I thought that was very moving, and it opened the door to something that I think is really important. Can you elaborate, talk about what, that, what you were talking about? I think that Zionism is just such a, a, a terrible ideology and such a, a mistake for people to believe in Zionism. At this point, there were times where I think Zionism was an inexcusable belief system. But Zionism at this point has just is totally dominated Jewish secular culture in the United States. And I think what I was probably talking about is the fact that I was made by that culture. Uh, I'm proud of uh, of the culture that made me, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the American Jewish culture that made me. To me, that was uh, an intellectual tradition, an uh, independent political tradition in the United States, opposition to the Vietnam War in my childhood. So it's a very personal narrative for me. And today, Jewish American secular culture is largely Zionist, right. and that's a tragedy. Do you think that could have been avoidable? In other words, when you talk about this culture you grew up with, this culture of Jewish American culture, what was that? Can you talk a little bit more about what that was? You know, my father was an academic. I was just raised with an idea that Jews had a tradition of social justice and they were outside of a mainstream of American society. We wanted to get in. I mean, I think that was that impulse of wanting to be in was very strong, as it is in many immigrant communities. I mean, third generation, second generation. But I think there was a lot to be said for that culture. There was a lot of leadership uh, in the anti-war movement in the 60s from the Jewish community. The SDS obviously had a large Jewish component. And, of course, the arts and literature and music, um, Jews were playing a prominent role in all those things. And I'm nostalgic about that partly because I think assimilation and wealth have wreaked havoc on that culture. That's what happens in America. I mean, there's an arc, but... Zionism played its part too, and Zionism, I don't know, Zion, it's, just, it's just awful what Zionism has done to the American Jewish community. Because? Well, Israel needed the American Jewish community, yeah. desperately needed the American Jewish community, and um, American Jews knew that, and American Jews, uh, I believe, willingly accepted that Yoridim role 
Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. But I was instructed. The first time I went to Israel, I was in my I was 50 years old. I got there late. I mean, if I had known, I would have gone over there uh, when I was a teenager because I could have gotten a girlfriend, you know. But they didn't. I, my parents were outside the community. They didn't. I didn't know that. They didn't send you the kibbutz or anything. No, no, I didn't get any of that. I, happily, I escaped a lot of the indoctrination. Yeah. And if I'd gotten a girlfriend, the indoctrination would have just been complete, you know, at my teens. However, I finally got over at 50 and met, saw my mother's best friend in Jerusalem. And she instructed me that they were Aliyah, and Aliyah was higher, and your deen were lower. You asked, why did the Jewish community in America sign up for the Zionist agenda? There were obviously many reasons for that. And one was, I don't think you can ever remove this, uh, when they say that, you know, we've been watching all these imagery of the Holocaust on television, you know, the Holocaust was being, and the Jews going, you know, being slaughtered and being too passive, they said, in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe. And then there's this image of these sunburnt Israeli soldiers, you know, uh, in the desert of the Sinai, smiling, and, you know, on the tanks on the cover of Look magazine. Obviously, there's a lot of propaganda in all this. I don't dismiss the idea of propaganda, but it was important to American Jews to have a different understanding of the new Jew of Zionism was an attractive image for American Jews. And Israel needed Jews, absolutely needed them, and we were lesser. We were not at the front lines. The Jews in Israel were the ones who were taking all the risks. Who were we to challenge their choices? I remember growing up, the conversation was... Oh, these American Jews! All they do is give money. You yeah. know, they, 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 you know, they're not strong enough to be here. You know, in the, to serve in the army. That's to do right. This. They, all they do is give money. Yeah, they're they, soft. That's they're soft. Yeah. And that's all they care about. And you know, these you know, yeah. kind of the um, like the Jews have always been in exile. You know, like the yeah. Jews in the diaspora. They're always a little bit weak, interested in more in money than this. But you know, so yeah. that was kind of you're right. That was like the 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 ascenders, the olim, which came. To Israel and the descenders who left or stayed yeah. outside. That was, yeah. that was a very clear. So I remember yeah. that conversation, uh, the adults talking like that yes. when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned 67 and these young Israelis sunburned with the guns yeah. and the tanks. Yeah. But you also mentioned 73. Yes. So could you talk a little bit about that? Well, so, I want to talk a little more about 67. Sure, on, please. Okay. The Jews of America, and I guess it was the 73 to they really thought that Israel was going to be pushed into the sea. Right. Okay. And so I'm not, it's not fair to Chomsky because I don't remember the exact thing, but I think that Chomsky would even say, here's this MIT professor who is a brilliant man, who's as well informed as anyone, and he was signing petitions, I believe, either in 67 or 73, of send more aid. You know, we're worried about Israel. So this community was willingly ravished by this understanding. And the great American poet Robert Lowell, uh, non-Jewish, wrote to his the poet Elizabeth Bishop in 67. He says, all my friends, all my Jewish friends who have been marching against the Vietnam War have turned into these terrible hawks about Israel. It's crazy. Okay, he said in 67. And Lyndon Johnson said, this community that won't let me send a screwdriver, I, I can't buy a screwdriver to send to the Tonkin Gulf, you know, to the American troops, they want me to be sending money to Israel right now. So I don't think this was, okay, there was a lot of propaganda. Obviously, we can strip away the propaganda about the 67 war and the 73, we can strip that away for a long time, the lies that were told and the belief, but there was a belief that Israel was in trouble and the American Jewish community was there for it, absolutely there for it. Yeah. And even I, being outside the community, I, I remember, you know, and bar mitzvah, whatever. I just remember the adopt that that was the American Jewish community rose in that situation and wanted to support Israel. I, I believe. So this is between sixty-seven and seventy-three. Right? Around that, yeah. I'm, I was a kid. I was eleven yeah. years old. So yeah. yeah. And some of this I should know better. I should have prepared for this, but yeah, I think that period was crucial, and I think that yeah, there was just yeah. I, I think it's an I, I think it's an arguable. But I was talking to speaking of sixty seven and the yes. mythology and the propaganda. I was talking to some 
um, ultra-Orthodox Jews, not, not far from here, actually, in upstate New York. And they were asking me if it's true that even secular Jews and secular Israelis believe that 67 was a miracle. Uh-huh. A miracle. Uh-huh. You know, secular Jews who don't yeah. believe in miracles yeah, 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 yeah. still believe it was a miracle because yeah. it was just an incredible thing. Yes. And, um, you know, in my book, In the General Sun, I have minutes from the meetings of the generals oh, leading up to the war yeah. s- describing the reality where the yes. Arab armies were not prepared for war. That's why yes. it's a great opportunity yeah. to attack. Yeah. And then, you know, in five days it was all done. Yeah, yeah. And so, rather than look at the at the facts and the and, and, and the reality, which yes. was that you know there was no way this war was not yes. going to end in a massive victory for Israel, as Johnson knew too, as Johnson knew too, and then in between we got to wedge in the story of the USS Liberty. Yes, of course. And Johnson, and what in the what what in the world happened there? You know what I mean? And that's completely ignored. And then again, yes. you've got this this propaganda machine which glorifies Israel, glorifies Israel, glorifies Israel, and at the same time. Creates the impression that Israel is somehow a victim. Yes, all true. Can you b- explain this? Can you? What do you think of? How do you see all this? Because you see it from a different angle than I do. I, yeah. I come from that other side. Well, I mean, I think Chomsky has said, you know, that this was a genuine belief here. You know, that Israel was at risk. Okay, so I, I think that was propagandized. Yeah, yeah, obviously. And uh, the new historians, and you yourself, and many others have helped to reverse that understanding, and that's a great thing. So I think that's wonderful. It's well known that Israel was not at risk, so, yeah. But I think that the word miracle is a helpful word. I like what that Satmar Rebbe said to you, because one of my favorite themes in, in covering this issue is that all these American secular Jews who speak of Israel as a miracle, they say it's a miracle. And American politicians say the birth of Israel is a miracle, and what Israel has done is a miracle, and the desert bloom. I mean, they're still selling this tripe now. You know, this propaganda is just endless, but these are, you know, Jewish intellectuals. This is where, this is what I mean by the destruction of Jewish culture. I'm sorry, it's taking a little while for me to understand that. Remember, you have intellectuals, Jewish intellectuals, saying that the uh, establishment, the, the birth and establishment of Israel is a miracle? I mean, please. I mean, uh, look, the creation of certain institutions and uh, prosperity in Israel in, in the annals of capitalism is, you know, it's, a, it's not a chapter, but it's in there. It's a, it's, it fits with modern capitalism. You know, they've done a, a great success by that. Yeah. I cede that to them. And, and certain institutions, civil institutions, I, but it's not a miracle. We've seen, you know... You go there and it's not whatever. Let's not get into what is. But I mean, we did. I mean, do we believe in miracles? Something. I mean, yeah, something exactly. Do we believe in yeah, miracles? I mean, I, I know. The use of that word is very strange. I agree with you. I and agree. even by the way, I agree with you. Yeah, you know, I again going back to my experiences with 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 the ultra orthodox community, uh, because I'm you know, I'm working on this book about them. Yeah, I've gone to synagogues. So them. I spend time Shabbos with them and things like that. And when you go through the prayer book, yes. The term six days, six days, six days, six days shows up so many times. And of course in Hebrew, shishayamim, 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 over and over again. And you go, this, this, the name, the six-day war, was not an accident. Wow, the war was actually ended in that. five days. The war yeah. really lasted five Didn't days. Didn't Diane get that one more day? And I think they just, you know, they just, <laughs> this phrase wow. speaks to Jews. Wow, you wow, know, It's not wow. just the six days, yeah, yeah. the days of creation, but in the yeah. prayer book, yeah. it's, you know, especially on Shabbos, yeah. over and over again, yeah. six days, six days, yeah. six days. Wow. So, I mean, it was, it, it was a perfect fit. Yeah. And, and, and again, some of these intellectuals who are sec- completely secular, who have nothing to do with religion or God, yeah. Uh, they talk about Israel in terms of, of a miracle, and they talk about the 67 in terms of a miracle and, and all of that. And you have to wonder, what what is it that a community that is actually doing well, granted, yes. you know, their, their grandparents came as immigrants and worked very hard, yes. and now the Jewish community is what it is in America. Why are they, why do they, where, where does this come in? Where does Israel come in? Why do they even care about this secular Zionist entity in Palestine? Why, where is that connection? Why is there such an emotional kind of, you know, connected to their heart somehow to this place, to this place, Israel. How and why? Because they live here, their kids are here, they don't want their kids to go there. Yeah. They don't want to go there. They're yeah. happy maybe to send money a little bit. But 
you know, it's a well-established, safe, you know, community here yeah. in this country. What, yeah. what is this? Yes. It's, it's something that people don't understand. I don't understand completely. Okay, but I feel that when you start, when you set it out in that fashion, which is a very helpful manner, what you just told me, I, I believe in the importance of religion in human affairs. And I think that we're talking about religion. So Zionism became the new religion. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, religion, so I have a pretty wide, open definition of religion. But, I mean, religion is something. So we're talking about intellectuals. Yes. But intellectuals can also be religious. Of course. When you're talking about a Jewish community, that is a religious community, be it ever so an ethnic one or a race, whatever. It's also a religious community. And now you tell me about that this was inscribed in the holy pages, too, of the six days. I think that there's a, that's part of what religion is. It's this community understanding that gives people meaning, gives them purpose in life, and that these things are inscribed religiously as well. There's obviously a very strong political dimension to it and the propaganda, but I, I think that ultimately we are talking about a religious community and a minority religion, minority religious community in America that believes delusions. I mean, ultimately, when we look at this American Jewish community, be it ever so successful, be it ever so wealthy, bourgeois, their kids are comfortable, et cetera, et cetera, they're doing great, on and on and on. They believe, and we use the word miracle, they believe delusions about Israel right now. You go to these people who are the best educated in America, or among the best educated in America, and they don't think there's apartheid there. That they don't, they're in absolute denial of the persecution and destruction of the Palestinian people. They are in complete fucking denial of this. And that is my role here. That is the thing that gives me purpose here, mm. is that they, those people, my people, of whom I am so proud, have signed off on the, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto and worse for, for another people. In our lifetimes, I have seen that right before my eyes. And that is, it's, it's, uh, it's religious, it's whatever it is, but it's certainly a political, whatever the sources of that delusion, it's ultimately a political question. And uh, it's the obligation of, I believe, every American Jew of conscience to address right now. Yeah, it has been the obligation of every American Jew of conscience to address for over 50 years, but it becomes ever more urgent, uh, you know. So that's kind of the sentiment that you expressed in that talk. Now I'm remembering, uh, yeah, of course, in, yeah. Last yeah. fall in, in, in Southern California. But talk now a little bit about your role. You've got Mondo Wise. But can I address please, this yeah. in terms of the role? Please, yeah. I think that what struck me in that moment was that uh, I'm a pariah in my own community. You're a pariah in this community. Members of my own family uh, hate what I do, okay? And here we were in an Arab American community that was welcoming us, that was celebrating us, that was giving me an award for my work. Now, I'm not an award seeker in life. I, life is its own reward for me. The pleasure of engagement, the, the intensity of engagement is its own. But they weren't honoring my work. God bless them. And my community has never done that. So uh, I have to face the fact that you know, it's just very moving to be surrounded by people who are ethnically completely different, religiously completely different from me, who are saluting what I've done. I, that, that, that's what I remember. I, that is really, that's really, it's very moving and it's a terrible, I don't want awards from the Jewish or any community, but, but the fact that we're we're held in contempt by the Jewish American community is just it's it's the problem. It's the problem. Now I have I'm optimistic about this, but you know I'm I think the American Jewish community is changing, but it's a very slow process. My role. I'm part of a large community of activist journalists. That's what I see my role as. So I work at this website that I founded uh, 16 years ago. 
that I began as a blog and now has a very activist component to it. Mondo, I see. Yeah. And I'm a senior editor there. I'm not uh, the top of this website anymore. I don't want to be at the top of any organization. Uh, I like uh, the ability to write and express myself. That's, you founded it, though, didn't you? I did found it, yeah, in 20, 2006. And that website has a very broad Palestinian... Uh, its agenda now is very broadly solidarity with Palestinian community and activism, uh, political, journalistic informational advocacy uh, in that regard in terms of this great struggle. My own interest is somewhat more parochial in that I am uh, I think the Jewish community is fucked and I care about that community to some degree. I, I still want to work on that community. I, I am moved by young Jews in America, what they're doing to try to save the community from Zionism. I place myself in that movement. Uh, and I'm also... I, and as an American, you know, our foreign policy is so disastrous in America in so many ways, and Israel's a big part of that. And so I feel that that's my role to play there, is to try to attack American foreign policy um, and re try to reform it if it's, you know, but in the Israel context, I think that that's where I can have the most sway. Because I think the Israel lobby is very powerful in terms of, uh, I mean, any mistakes we're making, the United States is making in Ukraine, I don't think are influenced by the Israel lobby. But the mistakes we're making in the Middle East on this Abraham Accords and cultivating Saudi Arabia, I think that's heavily influenced by the Israel lobby. And that's where I have, feel I have expertise. And Can you elaborate on that? on the Abraham Accord and why it's a mistake from an American foreign policy. Well, I regard the Abraham Accords as essentially a form of bribery by the United States to Arab monarchies. Uh, we will give you access to Washington if you sign off on Israel, if you normalize relations with Israel. So it's it basically, I mean, Biden wants Saudi Arabia for oil prices, I guess. Yeah, he wants, he's going to Saudi Arabia and overlooking the murder of Khashoggi because he wants to get oil prices down, but there's also, he wants to, to normalize relations with Israel because Israel drives our foreign policy there. And just as we have, if you look at Egypt, you know, we have uh, uh, supported Egypt now for uh, 30 some years, 40 some years. Since uh, Camp David. Yes. yes, and bribed Egypt because it's made peace with Israel. So Egypt got a great deal out of that in a way. It's it, But the people don't like that, especially of Egypt. It's not a democratic type of decision. But so the gifts are given to the regime. In other words, the deal is into the regime, not yeah. necessarily with the people, with the countries, what you're saying. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I do see the United States as bribing one monarchy after another or, or, or dictatorship uh, to make friends with Israel. Tunisia will be a deep blow because it's a little bit more democratic as a society, but they're bribing them to normalize relationships, uh, relations with Israel. And it really reveals the great conflict of the great struggle of this moment uh, in this conflict. The great struggle is BDS versus normalization. And they are normalizing relations. Trump started this in part because of BDS, because we are winning in BDS. We are we are delegitimizing Israel. We should be delegitimizing Israel. We should delegitimize an apartheid ethno nationalist Jewish state. You know, with, that is part of the role of liberals and left wingers and people who love progress and democracy. We should delegitimize. And we are gaining traction and they are trying to normalize relations with the Arab world. You know, so it's a big to legitimize Israel. So I see this as a great conflict. So what is, what is yeah. it that in terms of American foreign policy you think is wrong by bribing these regimes? If it works well for America, what's, why is that? Why, it's why it's is in that, the American interest. Why is, it not, is, or why is it not in the American interest to do that? Well, first of all, I think it's all in Israel's interest. That it is. Yeah. Without a doubt. Okay. So I have this confusion whenever... I, I think that there's a general problem in this country where we place Israel's interest ahead of American interest. Well, yeah. This is something that comes up in conversation a lot. Yeah. I, I dip into some of that. So can you talk about that? I mean, sure. explain that. Yeah. I don't want to romanticize American foreign policy at all because American foreign policy is so screwed up. But 
with respect to Israel, there is a narrative which I share in, which is that the State Department uh, in the 1940s did not want to create a Jewish state in Israel, in Palestine, excuse me, create Israel. It, it thought it was a bad idea. The State Department said, you do this, you will create unrest in this region for decades to come. The uh, Saudi king, I guess it was Abdullah, I believe, had said to FDR in 45, don't do this. Don't, don't, don't create it. Don't sign up for Zionism. And FDR said, we won't. And so that was betrayed by the Americans. And the State Department said on this basis, the, the Arabists in the State Department said, look, this is, you know, these are Arab countries. Palestine is an Arab country. And you, you're just going to create endless unrest. And lo and behold, we've had endless unrest. Now, I don't know, it wasn't exactly, you know, uh, a peaceable kingdom uh, b b before um, 48 or 1917. Where, you know, it's been obviously like every other part of the world. There's been a war and dislocation and this kind of thing. But since 48, it's just been, I, I think, that there's something to this point of view that the uh, the State Department said that these Arab, these wise people in the State Department said, we should not do this. And yet we did it. The United States did it. And so I think there is, so this narrative would be that that impulse on the part of the State Department was overridden by the, uh, what was then called the Jewish lobby or the Israel lobby in the 40s. And certainly Truman's um, uh, biggest donors uh, he needed money in that 48 campaign. His biggest donors were Zionist Jews. And his, uh, you know, former business partner um, in uh, Kansas City, uh, whose name escapes my mind right now, was, uh, was coming in and out of his office, you know, uh, had access to Truman's office, as the Israel lobby has had access to presidential offices almost ever since. And this guy was coming in and saying, you've got to recognize the Jewish state. And Chaim Weitzman, he was getting yeah, access. I mean, to, and all, you know, my grandfather was here, part of the delegation here in the United States as a diplomat, along with Abba Eben and, 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 and several others who, this is what they did. I mean, they were, yeah. they were here to influence, uh, to influence, particularly to work on the, on the recognition and the vote in 1947, yeah. November 1947, and the partition right. vote, which really legitimized yes. the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. And so, the, I mean, they were brilliant and they, yeah. their brilliance and their work goes back. You know, I have a poster advertising a lecture by my grandfather, Avram Katznelson, I think it's in Kiev in 1920, about the situation in Eretz Israel, yeah. the land of Israel, the situation yeah. of the Jews, and yeah. you know, promoting this idea. And these men, like Weizmann, and like Abba Eben, like my grandfather, were well-spoken, well-dressed, yeah. yeah, they're yeah. all you know, highly yeah. educated, very respected. And I think when they came in to these spaces with the presidents and the prime ministers in Europe and so forth, they were impressed by these people. And since they're all white European, you know, Eurocentric racists, they thought, well, let's deal with these people. And why do we deal with these Arabs? Who cares about these Arabs? And now going forward to where we are today, and as we're speaking here, Biden's about to take off for Jordan, yeah. Saudi Arabia, and, yeah. and Israel. There is an argument to be made that for in, in terms of American foreign policy, this turned out okay. Because look, there's this peace now between Israel and all these Arab countries, and there might even be a peace agreement, normalization with Saudi Arabia. It helps stability. We're selling everybody a lot of weapons, and so we're making money. Trump made that very clear. Mm -hmm. They said we're selling a lot of weapons, so we're making a lot of money. It's creating a lot of jobs. So is this really bad for American foreign policy? Is this bad foreign policy, or is this actually good for America? Mm -hmm. I think it's bad. Because... Well, I'm playing devils. I've been yeah, of course, no, 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 of course, it's just no, 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 of course, just, just no, 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 I, I, totally, I, no, I accept that. No, I no, no, I understand that's your role. No, no, perfect. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, let me answer again. I'm jumping around, but before I answer your question, let me just state that you know when Truman recognized when his arm was twisted to recognize. One of the things he said to his wife or someone, he says, "Is I've seen more arguments about religion." Then I have about money. People get, why do, why do they want to create a religious state? You don't want to do that. You know, so 
He's this plain spoken man from the Midwest understood that you don't want to create a religious state in and in, in, in an area which is largely Muslim. You know, what why the hell are they going he it went against his impulses. So I think that that is this romance that I'm offering you a little bit about this American impulse of actual fairness. And but and then what we saw is that people like Truman, Democrats were running to the right of the Republicans on this issue so that Eisenhower was actually fair on this issue. Eisenhower wanted the refugees to be able to return. Eisenhower, Nixon wanted them to be able to return. I mean, and the Democrats, and so it's all... I, I'm sorry. I'm getting into no, the this. Is very interesting. No, this, this is really good information. This no, but it's and and obviously Eisenhower is the last American president to say, "Fuck you guys, get the hell out of Sue, you know, the Sinai." No, you're getting out of there, and they got out of there. Okay, so why is it not in the American interest? I think that I mean, and and it's a great question. It's fair, and et cetera, et cetera. I think that ultimately, you know, we just get back to Palestine. We're always just back to Palestine. You can normalize relations with the whole world. You can buy the whole fucking world, America, but you have not been able to buy the Palestinians off. Now, they tried to buy the Palestinians off. The two-state solution, I believe, was essentially a buy-off of Palestinians, and it pitted one Palestinian community against another. You can buy off one and then sell out the ref whatever. They had this plan to buy out the Palestinians that the world agreed on, and Palestinians even agreed, and they they destroyed that plan. So they have destroyed this people's, any dreams for these people again and again. And again, I guess what I'm getting at is there are however many, uh, what are there, 7 million Palestinians in the land of Palestine, and there are uh, how many, however many in the diaspora. These people are not going to go away, and this problem is not going to go away until you respect their rights. You respect the Respect the dreams of these people, too. You know, my dreams in this country, the Jewish dream in this country, I don't know about Israelis. I mean, I know they're prosperous as hell, but, you know, we have had such a, we have, part of, the, part of my understanding about this stems from the fact that we have had the American dream. American Jews have had the American dream. You're interviewing me in an incredibly beautiful house. You know, I live a very privileged life by global standards, by American standards as well. And that was delivered to American Jews. From my grandfathers who were immigrants, we have had this incredible, prosperous trip inside the ride inside the United States that I don't think is going to end. And the way we crush the dreams of Palestinians every day is just morally offensive to me. And it's just, that's my life's work right now. I, I just... So you, you, you will not, no one will get out of this situation. No one will get out of this situation until we begin to respect those people as, as human beings with rights that are equal to ours. And, I mean, that's... This, this brings up something, uh, just a little anecdote. Yeah. There was an event in Tacoma, Washington... Tacoma is kind of a suburb between I know Washington and, yeah, you know, so there was an event about Palestine there, and it was taking place in kind of a kind of a community center. So there was a lot of you know commotion and resistance to it, and it became a very big deal. And uh -huh. It turned out to be like a sold out, fully packed thing. I was right. supposed to be on it, then I was disinvited to be on it. It was supposed to be a panel back and forth. How long ago? This is just before COVID. Oh, okay, just before COVID. And then they compromised. They had some guy from J Street. Yeah. And they had another guy, a friend of mine, Tahir Rizala, from AMP. Okay. And there was they brought some famous moderator. They paid a lot of money to bring some moderator down from New York, and he moderated. And it was very interesting. And yeah. it started off, you know, very nice. And then gradually, of course, between the two speakers, there was a chasm. Because, like you said, there's a moral truth, and then there's the immoral, you know, story of Israel. And then it was very tense. It was very good. And at the end, it was Q&A. At the very, very end of the Q&A... This older gentleman who was from that community, clearly lived there his whole life, clearly wealthy, clearly his kids are there, mm -hmm. you know, a very established kind of member of the community who's Jewish. And he says to Tahir, the Palestinian, he says, don't you think that we deserve a place to call home? Don't you just think we deserve a place where we can feel safe? And this is the backdrop of what you just described as the journey of Jews in this country, right? Yeah. And I'm looking at this guy thinking... 
what is he talking about? What do you mean? Look at you, where you live, look at where you are, look at the history of this country, you know, the Tala and so on. And Tahir looks at him, and this was the very end, this is the last answer, the last question of a very long, very tense evening. He goes, I have four words for you. Not at my expense. Mm-hmm. That was the end of the evening, and it was just like, wow. This was mm-hmm. like Muhammad Ali knockout. Four words, done. And somehow it doesn't occur to anyone that, number one, with this, this narrative that this older Jewish gentleman was describing is completely absurd. Yeah. And that this is happening at somebody else's expense. And what about these people? How is it that they're expendable? Yeah. And how is it that to these people that you described as intellectual and highly educated yeah. and mostly caring and very progressive about all these issues? Yeah. These are the people who are just expendable. The Palestinians are expendable. It's a tragedy. So this response I saw was it was it was beautiful. it was beautiful and it was also showed some strength and hope to say, you know what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. What you're saying is completely yeah. completely absurd. And I mean there's a three word answer too, it's like that we you and I discussed. What about Poland? You know, I mean, it's kind of like, you want a safe place, you know, you got, we got annihilated in Poland, you know, so, and then we, whatever, we were already here, but, you know, our, our homeland is more, in, in, in Poland, you, than yeah, in yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Palestine some more. Okay. I'm very passionate about it. I am passionate about it. And you're very passionate about the role that the American Jews play. Talk a little bit about that more, if you will. And then I want to ask you about kind of where we go from here. Because you said, I'll let me backtrack. You, you said two things that I found interesting because they're, they're contradictory. You're talking about how there was a fallen number of members of Congress, Jewish members of Congress in New York, for example. But then, so there was kind of a decline in power. That's happening now. Yeah. But at the same time, you said that was a good thing. Yes. Um, so can you clarify that? And maybe then we'll talk about Palestine. Okay. Yeah. Um, and why is it even important? It we're, important we're, so? we're in a moment now where the, the great Jewish golden moment in American history, in the establishment, Jews are the wealthiest group by religion in the United States. Okay. If you look at sort out groups by religion and wealth, Pew, Jews... 44% of American Jewish households make 100,000 or more. The average is 19%. This is a few years ago, but that's the latest. So, and Episcopalians are behind them. Hindus are behind Jews. So you have the wealthiest American community by um, religion in my, my community. Very successful community. That wealth is not, I don't think, is, is, is not subsiding but the period in which that community sought public office and wanted to be in prominent positions, I think, is beginning to change now. And it's becoming more of an old wealth community. And what characterized the period, the golden moment, was you had, I think, three Jews on the Supreme Court at one time. Um, Yeah, three, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan. Now there's just one. Uh, Jew on the Supreme Court. And um, Obama's both, uh, I think Obama's two nominees were, or Clinton's two, I forget. There was a period in which these administrations were considered uh, as as even Jews would say, the most philo-Semitic uh, White Houses in, in history, the Clinton one, the Bush one. So I think that that period is coming to an end. And I think it's great in some ways. Because if you look at Ben Rhodes, Ben Rhodes worked on Middle East policy for uh, Obama. And he said, uh, he said a number of important things about, he's half Jewish or whatever, but uh, about crafting Middle East policy under Obama. Uh, First of all, whenever Obama said anything mildly critical of Israel, the Jewish organizations were on the phone and they had complete access to his office. He said, you know, 10 to 20 of these organizations could come into my office as a foreign policy, top foreign policy aide. They came in more, th- those groups came in more than all the rest of the groups on all other policy combined, so or, or around half. The other half was all other issues, but the American Jewish organizations could just come in when they wanted because of campaign contributions to the Obama administration. 
I say it is a good thing because, going back to Rhodes, he has said, you know, at one point he was looking around at the Middle East policy team in the White House, and, you know, a dozen people there getting together before the trip to Israel in 2013 or something like that. And, you know, out of a dozen people, eight or nine of them were Jewish. That's not right. You know, I mean, it's a sign of great, we were, in the, it's a sign of how, how, assim, how, how accepted we were in the American elites. We had been accepted in the American elites. We're, uh, we're, we're essential to those elites. A Jewish wealth is essential to the Democratic Party and to artistic and, and, and creative production in the United States. Finance, I mean, Jews are, uh, are, are just a, a vital component of uh, capitalism in America that's just inarguable and therefore of, of elite culture and elite political culture. But it's not right when you're dealing with a political question like this that, uh, that there's so many Jews in the room. And I include myself in that. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I've had a learning curve about Palestine. Palestinians shouldn't have a need. I shouldn't be representing Palestinians' uh, perspective in the United States. I'm happy to shepherd it at this point in my career. I'm happy to echo what I hear, but I'm not going to be a spokesman for that community. And that community deserves, as it's the biggest stakeholder of all here. And they're not represented. I mean, I just think that, again, I, we just get back to the enormity of this injustice. It's just the enormity of it. And it's just, in, it's just, uh, deeply satisfying to me now to see so many Palestinian Americans in the public sphere and running for office. And a, a person like Rashida Tlaib in Michigan, just a tremendous politician, a person enormously attractive and appealing and positive, and who can speak about apartheid on the, on the floor of the House and get denounced by the Israel lobby. But the point is that I, I think that it, it's ultimately political that, that you cannot kept, you can't go into the Jewish community to get the Palestinian perspective, and that includes left wing Jews like myself. You cannot come to us for that perspective. No, you go to the horse's mouth, and that is what I think is going to be ha is what we're going to be seeing now is Palestinians who are perfectly capable of representing themselves being granted a place in American culture. Well, I hear this a lot from Palestinians, old and young, that when they say to me, you can say we can't. You know, okay. I, just, I just met with a group okay. of young Palestinians in D.C., yeah. Palestinians who came with a bunch of Israelis, yeah. and they're saying there's no way we would have been able to intern you know, on, uh, on Capitol Hill if we were not coming in a group with these Israelis. We never would have been accepted. We never would have been, there would not have been a program for us. We have to, you know, we have to dovetail. We have to yeah. be the of these Israelis. And they listen to me talk and they go, wow, you say things that we wouldn't even dream right. of saying publicly yeah. because we would be denounced. And these yeah. have been young people. Yeah. Old people say it, of course, uh, as well. Um, so so that is that is a tragic reality. I, I yeah. agree with you. I agree with you on that completely. But, but Miko, just to be clear, to understand what you're saying, you're talking about Palestinians, not Palestinian Americans. Yeah. And that? Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, both, actually. Okay. Fair enough, but honest, continue. Right, for that. Honest, okay. And so, you know, that's the reality. Now, I think the big elephant in the room when we talk about Jews in politics, yeah. in American politics, is, well, I guess there are two elephants. One yeah. is Zionism. In other words, you and I are both Jewish. Yeah. You're an American Jew born and raised here. Neither one of us are a Zionist. Yes. So is it, because, is it, is it the power of American Jews or American, American Jews or Zionists? That's one question. The other yeah. question is, the other bigger, maybe even bigger elephant is $3.8 billion a year. Yes. Is that reliant somehow on, on, on Jews in Congress, on Jews being around the White House, on Jews having access, or is that something that's, that's uh, independent of that? Yeah. The fact that the U.S. gives uh, all this foreign aid to a country that really doesn't need foreign aid because it's wealthy. Yeah. I think it. I I think my, the way I answer that question is I say that is the it's the Israel lobby. It's the access of Jewish organizations that are Zionists that has created that three point eight billion. I think it's simple. Now people, you know, disagree with me on this. They they think it's American interest or American foreign policy. I I just I'm not convinced. I think that 
the American Jewish community is just still too important in the Democratic Party for it to alienate that community. It cannot alienate that community. But do you think if there's a decline in the number of politicians who are Jewish, American Jews, will that affect the 3.8 billion? Or is it irrelevant because APAC is there to make sure this happens? And I agree with you. I do think okay. I do think it's APAC that, that does, okay. that does the, the, the heavy lifting on this. Well, there are a number of factors right now that are going to drop. I, I believe that that $3.8 billion is going to be a high point and that it's going to start going. I'm a very optimistic person. Talk about that. Okay. But that's temperamental. I'm just an optimistic person. But yeah, I think I that $3.8 billion is going to start going like this. That's, Why? Or how? God willing. Uh, I think that uh, too many Americans are getting wise to what the, the apartheid and the human rights atrocities. And... I'm just optimistic that way. And I think that American Jewish community is very powerful in this connection. And even the American Jewish, the young American Jews are getting woke on apartheid. So again, I'm just an optimist on this. But I, and so I, we can predict all day long. And uh, I, I, in any case, I think that there is going to be growing, there's growing awareness of this. And I think that even in this election cycle, we are seeing uh, that um, in Michigan, Andy Levin, a liberal Zionist, uh, two-state guy, you know, denier of apartheid, hater of BDS. I met him actually in Washington, and he swore to me that no Jewish congressman will ever sign on to Betty McCollum's, you know, ch child protection bill because it goes too far. And was he? Is he right? When was that? When did he say that? Uh, just before COVID, I met him. Do you think any Jewish congressman has signed onto that? Is not he already my, wrong? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. No, he said this is a decision. Okay. This was the decision that was made. They're not of them are going to sign on to this. Oh, wow. That's great. There's your conspiracy already. Right. Anyway. Uh, Go on. You were talking about No, him. but you were he, saying something. Okay, so Levin, Levin is a guy who three years ago when uh, Elon Omar of Mich Minnesota said, uh, why are they supporting, you know, she, she was saying, why are they supporting Israel all the time? Because it's the Benjamins, you know, it's the money, it's APAC. And she was denounced as anti-Semite for that. Well, and including by Levin, he said this anti-Semitic, that son of a bitch. Well, now Levin is running against APAC in Michigan. That's his lane. He is in a district. He's in a combined district with Haley Stevens, who's a congresswoman who's for APAC. And he's for J Street, Levin. They're pitted. And he's running against APAC in his election, and she is running for Israel. So you're getting, and they're both Democrats. So you're getting a little bit of a test right now about whether, first of all, it's, it's novel that people are running against APAC. Uh, an established Democrat is running against APAC. So that's great. What's not great is that he's a liberal Zionist. Yeah, it's okay. Street, yeah. okay. This, this is really J Street and APAC right. against each other. That's right. The actual nominees are That's less right. important. Now, but see, I'm an optimist because I feel that J Street, which I don't support in many ways, is breaking open the discussion. They're making Israel more of a political football. I want Israel to be a political football in this country. It's never been a political football. You're never allowed to discuss it. Well, now these people are arguing so if they're arguing, then how come, you know, hey, you, you have this view of Israel and you have that view of Israel, and I think it's an apartheid country. Can I get in the discussion? So I think that that's going to happen inevitably. I think more and more people are going to be able to say the apartheid thing. So, and, 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 and the polling shows that among young Democrats, they want, to, they want us to lean toward Palestine by three to one. The young ones are two to one. So I'm optimistic. So let me... Let me say this so it's an apartheid regime it should have no legitimacy um it's illegitimate you know i i always say israel is not committing apartheid israel is the apartheid israel is not committing crimes uh against humanity israel is the crime against humanity it's the entity that's the crime it's not a legitimate entity that's committing a crime that needs to be remedied the entity itself is the crime. As you said in the speech in uh, California. Right. Right yeah, excellent right. speech. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And then uh, my, my view is that we need to get to a point where politicians, just the way politicians are, you know, don't want to be called anti-Semitic, that politicians will not want to be called Zionist. I, I That's agree where with we you. want to go. I think I, that I, is where right. things will change. When politicians understand that there's, there's no room for, no legitimacy, 
and the Zionism has to be rejected completely, that's where we need to go with this. I like it. So how do we go, you, in your view, from where we are today, which I agree with you, there's some, there's some shift. There are some yeah. shifts. I mean, there are members of... There are members of Congress who talk about apartheid when they give speeches in the chamber. Yeah. Even yeah. even uh, Chris Van Hollen, who's a senator from, yeah. uh, from, Maryland. from Maryland, he didn't say apartheid, God forbid. But in 2019, in the debate about you know the, the first bill out of the Senate, S1, was supposed to be this all pro-Israel you know kind of a bill. There was a BDS or anti-BDS clause, yeah. and he said, "This is a red line. I cannot tell my constituents." He gave a great speech on the Senate floor. Um, which I encourage people to, to listen to. Uh, listen, said, I've there seen is a red line. I cannot tell my constituents that they cannot boycott because that's protected. Then he gives all the examples where this went to court, yeah. these laws went to, yeah. yes, court, went to court and lost, and was yeah. out of court, and that he agrees with that. Yes. And now he's also signed on to uh, a, a demand to investigate Shirin Abakla's murder. Yes, he has. And so, Great. This is and this is Zionist, and he says, you know, the, pre- the preamble is, I love Israel, I support Israel, I don't agree with BDS, blah, 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 but there are lines. And I think these politicians who understand that there are lines, maybe they still remember why they got into this to begin with, maybe they still have a conscience. These are the ones that we need to get to the point where they reject Zionism completely, and they understand that if they are associated with Zionism, they become unelectable. Mm-hmm. Just like if they're associated with... Anti-Palestinian racism. It's racism against Palestinians. Yeah. So, in your view, how do we go? And, and I think I think your role or the role of Mondo Weiss, yeah. you know, has a role in this yeah. for sure. Um, but we need we need to do something big. We need we need to have some kind of a moment here okay. that shakes things up. I just want to say that in two thousand and seven, I was walking up Broadway fifteen years ago, uh, and I was starting this work. And I'd finally been to Israel and Palestine. And I was walking up uh, Broadway with a Palestinian guy late at night. We had just seen uh, Anita Shapiro or some Zionist historian, uh, some event in Columbia. And he was a grad student at Columbia. And he said, he walked out, we were walking in the street in Broadway. And he said, my goal in life is to bring down Zionism. And I remember, I'm just telling you how I felt. This is 15 years ago. I was shocked that he said that. I didn't know how I felt about it, and I found it bracing. And as a journalist, I found it kind of remarkable that this is what this person was committed to, that he would say this. And the next day, I called him and I said, can I quote you? I think it was an amazing moment. I just wanted to set this stage, and we had just seen an leadership. He said, no, 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 you can't quote me on this. It would hurt my career, whatever. And we have gone from that moment where I was a virgin to that type of rhetoric and shocked by it. We've gone from that moment, and Norman Finkelstein is saying, you can't run against Zionism. Don't People don't know what Zionism is. Five years later, in 2012, he said, don't talk about Zionism. We've gone from those moments to where a lot of people are out as anti-Zionists in America. And there are people walking up the street, including Jews, saying, my goal in life is to bring down Zionism. Now, you were talking about Congress. I'm not talking about Congress right now. I'm talking about the discourse. I'm talking about the way the grassroots have shifted. So that's what gives me hope about this. And the other thing that, to turn it back on you before we go strategic is, you've met these people like Van Hollen and and Levin. You've met a lot of these people over the the course of your life, right? Uh, Not many, no. Okay, they they stay, they wouldn't come close to me. I don't know what had happened with Andy Levin that he ended up meeting me, but most of them wouldn't, wouldn't sit in the room with me. Okay, but here's my question about those those guys, yeah. those assholes. Okay. There's a special place in hell, you and I, I think, would agree, for someone who witnesses apartheid and comes back and tells people he didn't see apartheid, right? right. Those people Absolutely. are going to spend a lot of time, you know, yeah. in front of some really hot coals someday. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people do that. Yeah, just secular people talking about hell, but that's yeah, you know, I'm not. Like I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a religious person at some level. I'm not yeah, religious. Okay. okay, but here's my point about this: these guys have been there, right? Mm-hmm. They're not stupid. They know. They know. They hasn't they? Know. They've seen this. They it know. takes five minutes over there to see that you're seeing this crushing injustice. You don't right? Even have to be there. Okay, so when Van Hollen makes the statement, I uh, you don't have to be there, but God knows when you've oh, been yeah. there, it 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 curdles your 
spleen. Okay, and then you go back and lie. Now, as a politician, your job in life, you learn early on, is you're going to lie about shit. That's part of your work as a politician. That's, right. Okay. But I just think that when he says, I love Israel, the beginning of the speech, how many of these politicians are saying, I love Israel, because there's inside their brain is saying, I hate Israel? Is that a possibility? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I think it's like paying taxes. You have to be loyal <laughs> to Israel. It's something you have to do. It's a cost of doing business. If you want to be successful in politics, you have to pledge this allegiance, and you have to vote for the foreign aid bill, and you have to vote for the weapons bill, and you have to vote for the extra weapons bill in case they spend some of the weapons on, you know, massacring people in Gaza. They need, obviously, they need more of that. So that's the cost of doing business when you're an American politician. Yeah. I think, again, thinking strategically, we need to change okay. that to the point, to the play. Yeah, and you know, and we've seen this happen. We've seen okay. this in South Africa. So elaborate. You know, we've seen this happen in South Africa. I mean, South Africa, and people tend to forget this, but South Africa controlled all of Southern Africa. Okay. If you dropped, you know, Palestine in South in, inside that space, you wouldn't even see it. Right. Right. They had gold, they had uranium, they had nuclear weapons. And again, they controlled all of Southern Africa, all the way up to Angola until, you know, the Cubans kicked them out. Yeah. That country ended up on its knees. They could not participate in the Olympics, in, in any world sports, in any academic events. In a, there were no diplomats anywhere. You couldn't buy South African products. They couldn't sell. You, they were done. They couldn't play rugby. They were on their knees. And then this guy, the clerk, Stood up one day and ended it. Okay, so help me, because this is very helpful to me. I mean, I, this is, but I'm curious, what was that interval between uh, they owned all of Southern Africa to they were on their knees? What, how long was that, and how do you propose to achieve that arc in uh, the Palestine question? Well, that's question? the million-dollar question. How do we go from there to here, and what happened, and how do we replicate? And, and a large part of it was, uh, was BDS. Yeah, a lot of part of it was boycott, divestment, sanctions. Absolutely. And but none of these would have happened had it not been for politicians around the world, particularly in America and the UK, who had to shift because the politicians were under a lot of pressure not to oppose South Africa. They were a lot of, under a lot of pressure to resist boycott, boycotting. I think the United States was the last country to boycott South Africa. And what so, were the sources of that pressure in that case? Well, there's people campaigning here in the United States, grassroots campaigning, as but, far as I know. But I understand, but just to be clear, there was no Afrikaans lobby in the United States, or there was, but I, you know, there wasn't a large Afrikaans community in the United States. I think the, I think the, I think the um, as far as I understand it, I think the motivation was capitalism. Okay. Money. Okay. You know, there's a lot of investment, the banks, the corporations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They did not want to change. This, okay. Uh, they did not want to rock that boat. Yes, yes. Yet... Just to somehow won. Right. The right, the you know, people on our side, the people on the side of justice, on the side of the anti-apartheid won this enormous battle, enormous fight. So it's happened before. Yes. It has happened before. So, and of course, the Israelis learned a lot from that. So they're, they're 100 years ahead of us. But we lack a strategy. We lack this a clear vision of how we get from where we are today where Israel's making peace with, you know, is probably about to make peace with Saudi Arabia, a normalized relationship with Saudi Arabia, to the point where Zionism is considered, um, you know, a bad word and there's no legitimacy to Zionism and so on. That's what I think we're lacking and that's a big problem and that's kind of this big void and I think because there's a void, people deal with, uh, with the nonsense, people deal with the gossip. Is it, okay. If Abu Mazen dies, who's going to take his place? Who yeah. cares? So okay. Like an because they're irrelevant, that sort of thing. You know, is okay. it going to be Netanyahu or Bennett or Shmenet? Who cares? I mean, this is all complete, this is yeah. gossip. Yeah. This is not the yeah. substance. I think you are good at this discussion. I'm a gossip, I'm a journalist. I care, Bennett, Shmenet, Netanyahu, <laughs> Andy Levin, Haley Stevens. Yeah. This is my work. So I'm involved in that kind of granular bullshit. But these are not the same things because Andy Levin can be perhaps, you know, brought to the place where he underst not understands, yeah, yeah. but forced to reject Zionism. Netanyahu never rejects Zionism. Right? Okay. Right now it's just gonna, you know. But how do you, what, how do you, are you having discussions on this score? Are you a strategic thinker along these lines. I know you're an intellectual and, you know, you're a public figure, 
But are you also a strategist about this? I think about it all the time. I'm looking for a strategy and I'm trying to get people together here and in Palestine with my Palestinian friends yeah. and everybody's complaining about the same thing. So you're a general at heart. There is no, oh God forbid, there is no, there is no strategy. So in Palestine, there's a problem because you want to get, you want to get a Palestinian, you know, local leaders from, from Hebron, yeah. from Ramallah, from Lid, from Yaffa and from Jerusalem together. You can't. Logistically, yeah. they can never get together. Yeah, yeah. And if one of them gets in the car to go to the other place, either the Palestinian, if it's in the West Bank, the Palestinian secret police, or if it's inside Israel in 1948, the Israeli secret police will arrest them before they even get there. Wow. So even if you they manage to find a way to travel, and you, there's ways to travel in and out of the yeah. West Bank, it's pretty porous, but the secret police will already know that they're on their way and they'll be arrested. So it's very difficult to create any kind of of, of meeting of the minds okay. or a physical meeting where people can form a strategy. Here we don't have that that problem. Right. We can get together. I can drive up here from DC yeah. and we can sit for three days and strategize yeah. if we choose to do so. So you, you spoke very passionately about how you feel about the Palestinian plight and the rights of Palestinians. That's a big part of what we're talking about. That's right. a big part of what you and I are both committed to. So what is the, like, wake up in the morning one day and what do you see, like, as, like, it's worked, we've succeeded, it's happened? Do you have a vision of that? I, I'm not a visionary that way, except that I look at the successes in America and world history that I've observed in my lifetime, and they're never, I mean, I want, pro, I want significant, pro, I, well, I want a democracy. I want a democracy. What are we fighting for? I think we're fighting for equal rights in Palestine, in Israel, Palestine, with that territory. We're fighting for equal rights there. That's what I'm fighting for. I want equal rights there. It's a situation where, if you look at history, there's a lot of bloodshed. And I would hope to avoid that. You know, so I'm a little bit of a moderate and a liberal in terms of the steps that that's in. But ultimately, I want to see equal rights in that, in that, uh, in that land. I think that that, and it could be a model to the world. It's a mo- that's what's going to happen. Ultimately, I hope that this will be a model to the world about how to resolve these. Yeah, that that place should be a model, and it's not a model. It's a model of oppression and persecution. And what do you think is going to happen here in terms of American Jews who are so? fervently Zionist and so fervently feel so strongly that they need a homeland over there. They're going to die. And their kids are not going to care? Yeah. So like what Ben Grant said about the Palestinians but never happened, you're, you're saying is going to happen here where they see... Well, the funny. Old, the yeah, old, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll forget. Old, the young will forget. We'll forget, yeah. Except, I think you're right here because the stake, if, you know, young Americans don't have a stake in Palestine. Right. Whereas I think maybe these old Jews... Yeah, thought they did. Yeah, and in Palestine they have a stake. The yes. even young kids have a, still have a stake in Palestine, obviously, for obvious reasons. Yeah, this is where they came from. I, I think that that's an unfortunate statement on my part because that's slow. That's generational. I'm talking about generation. It is a problem that should be addressed right now. Yeah. You know, but I think a lot of little changes are happening. I'm, I'm just optimistic that. No, I'm optimistic too. Oh, yeah. you are. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Why? I'm, I'm very optimistic. Well, not well, because you said it's a temperament thing. I, I'm an yeah. optimistic okay. person. Yeah, and so, but I also think that um, there is a movement that's changing. There's a mood that's changing. I think that I can envision a place where these politicians, for selfish reasons, granted, but will reject Zionism because they'll understand they're not going to get elected if they don't, and that's a reality that we are responsible for. I think here. And I also absolutely know, without any shred of a doubt, that the reality in Palestine today is is just unsustainable. Yeah. You have 30 minutes from Tel Aviv, a city that is all full of fun and sunshine and beach and beaches. 30 minutes away, you have 2 million people. 2 million people. I mean, think of the number. 2 million people living in a concentration camp without access to water, without access to nutrition, without access to, you know, basic medicine. Forget the bombing for a minute. A child with an ear infection with no antibiotics. One of the most literate populations in the world. And one of the most highly Highly literate and highly educated literate populations in the world. That is not sustainable. Now add to this, two million Palestinians who have this dubious uh, citizenships, kind of an Israeli citizenship, their homes are being demolished thousands per year. 
all over the country. They cannot build, they have no rights, they have no access to water, they have no access to those kind of rights. Their citizenship and the citizenship that I enjoy as a, are night and day, as an Israel, night and day. Yeah. They are divided into different categories uh, within the state. So the Bedouin and the Nakab in the south, they are governed by the Bedouin uh, agency, whatever, mm-hmm. the Israeli agency that deals with Bedouin. You know, the Israelis in the Nakab enjoy some of the highest standard of living wow. among Israelis. The Bedouins are the poorest of the poor, wow. yeah. you know, across the street from yeah, each yeah. other and so on. So, I mean, this whole reality is sustainable. It's, and then you've got the ghettos in this area that is now called Judea and Samaria. Yeah. It used to be called the West Bank, but it's yeah. really created by Israel. We've got these ghettos with another three or three and a half million Palestinians that have no rights. Yeah. But that's been sustained. You said it's unsustainable. It's been sustained for 50, 70 years. Yes. Why is it unsustainable now? Well, the fact that it's unsustainable doesn't mean it can't go on for a very long time. Okay. It can go on for a very long yeah. time, but eventually, I see. If this thing is going to collapse, it's not sustainable. I agree you cannot you. have that kind. Of, and we're not talking about a place that's, we're talking about one of the highest profile spots on the face of the earth. Yes. You know, and we're talking about a society, the Israeli society, that is producing a, um, a political leadership that is so violent. Yeah, and so extreme. It's always been violent and extreme from yeah. the very beginning. I don't think it's yeah. become more extreme. I just think they they're not hiding it anymore. Uh huh. And they're so violent to the point where they will destroy Alexa. Yeah. They See, will. I, I can't believe destroy that. Alexa. I don't want to believe and that. Unless we yeah. intervene, and I think, I, yeah. and I hope we will. Yeah. Unless we intervene, this magnificent fifteen hundred year old structure. Forget for a moment the religious. Significance yeah. of this place, but historical, yeah, architecturally, culturally, will be gone. Right, but isn't and at that... some point people are going to realize they have to step in, and hopefully it'll be sooner rather than yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's unsustainable, okay. but again, yeah. it doesn't mean it can't last for a very long yeah. time. It's it's up to us and how hard yeah. we work, you know. And when yeah. I say we, I mean people of conscience around the world. Yeah. If we work harder, it'll end sooner. If we work, you know, yeah. slower, it's going to last yeah. longer. Yeah. But the threat, I think, is becoming evidently clear. Uh huh. That's great. And that is a good thing. That's great. How soon it'll stop? Again, yeah. People always say, well, "How long do you think it's going to take?" Well, it depends on us. Yeah, I agree with you. It does depend on us. And I mean, I, this is where I celebrate what we've done. You know, you have done, I've done. I mean, a lot of our friends have done is trying to raise in consciousness. Yeah. That word I used to hear as a kid, you know, I mean, it's, we're raising consciousness. Yeah. And we're fighting against huge enemies, but we're raising it. Yeah. You know? And these enemies have lost in the past. So uh, that's why I'm optimistic, too. Wow, that's good. They yeah. have lost in the past. The apartheid in South Africa fell. You know, uh, dictatorships in Latin America eventually. Yeah, fell. the problem, the problem with the way, uh, the, my problem with that is that when you talk about capitalism being invested in South Africa, which was obviously true, capitalism doesn't like nuisances. Nuisances in the end, capitalism, the George Floyd thing, you know, uh, the trans bathrooms things, they don't like the controversy. They will tiptoe away from that and say, you have to deal with this. Religious people don't give a shit. And so I think this is a religious thing, not a capitalist thing. And it goes back to that Truman statement about people argue about religion more than they argue about money. I think people care more about religion than they care about money. And the money people, if it was strictly a money thing, that Palestine thing right now, people would be going into the White House and saying, we got to, you know, this is, we're going to start losing money here, the media, whatever. But I think they're just religiously attached to this. So we have to overcome this kind of like devotional ideology, this racist, of, uh, like a la the Nazis or something, you know, yeah. that, that idea. But whatever. I think, I think Brent Rosen, just to give him credit, said that Zionism is the new religion in American. Brent American. Stevens. Yeah. Brent Rosen. Oh, Brent Rosen said, yeah. 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 The Zionism is the new religion. Oh. You know, Rabbi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Chicago. Yeah. So, and, and, and I think it's true, and I think what they've done, and just kind of wrap it up, yes. um, they've turned Zionism into the nationalism, this extreme version of, of nationalism yeah. is like a religion. Yeah. And so, for example, I touched on it last time, I noticed you were kind of, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the whole idea of the Temple Mount and the, yeah. and the, and the, and the you know, building the temple. I remember singing songs as a little boy about the building the temple. 
I was a completely secular boy. Yeah. Um, the song Jerusalem of Gold. Yeah, yeah. Which was commissioned two weeks before the 1967 war. Wow. As a propaganda tool. Yeah. Talked about the Temple Mount being empty, the streets of the old city being, you know, hauntedly empty, the water wells were dry. Yeah. And then after the war, she added uh, another another paragraph saying, now the water wells are flowing. People are praying on the Temple Mount. The market streets are filled with people. Wow. Wow. So people. And, and Naomi Shemmer, she was secular Zionist, as wow. secular as anybody. Wow. The most iconic sentence, the most iconic thing that people remember from the 1967 war, ask any Israeli. When the commander of the paratroopers took the old city, yeah. and he said, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Wow. What did he care about Harabait? What did he yeah. care about Temple Mount? Yeah, yeah. Religious thing? But Zionism has turned it into a nationalistic thing, and all Israel, good Israelis want to see the Temple. Yeah. Why? Who knows? Yeah. But that means a very dangerous thing. Yes. You know? And that's where we need to step in and re remind people what's at stake here. But thank you for your time, and thank, thank you for your work. work. It's a real pleasure. Real pleasure, yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming up Absolutely. here. And, yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for your work. That's our show. Thanks to Miko Pellet for letting us share this program with our listeners. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication with no paywalls. If you would like to support our work, go to mondoweiss.net slash donate. Please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find the show. Subscribe to one of our free email newsletters so you can stay up to date on events in Palestine and related politics here in the U.S. and around the world. Finally, if you have any more feedback, send me an email at dave at mondaweiss.net. Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with a new episode.